with infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. When you're all caught up with Into the Fray and need another great interview-based podcast to listen to, head over and subscribe to Jim Harold's Campfire. Jim is one of the OGs of paranormal podcasting, and his shows have been downloaded over 60 million times. He talks to real people with true and fascinating experiences, from the spooky and scary to the heartwarming. There's been a ghost story involving serial killer Ted Bundy, an eight-legged demon, and a recipient's true address that the mailman noticed was not of this earth. You can tune in to Jim Harold's Campfire on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to Into the Fray. So on this edition of Into the Fray, I have on with me Sally Gage. And Sally, from the sounds of it, you have had not only a lifetime of experiences, but you're also pretty heavy into investigating and researching. And, you know, not to tease anybody, because I think I would like to go in succession with some of your stories and we'll start with, you know, why you do all the, the things that you do. But I don't want anybody to go anywhere because you were mentioned on Into the Fray episode 302, and I titled that the Kudzu Kelpie, and of course that was uh, Mark Muncy of Erie, Florida on with me, and he mentioned the report of the truck driver in North Florida just outside Jacksonville, and that he saw something moving in the Kudzu vines, and it ended up being a horse made up of kudzu vines and it scared literally the piss out of him and he pulled over and he had to clean himself up and not two weeks later before mark had even released this report that he had gotten he mentioned that someone had emailed him a friend of his and had also seen this quote-unquote kudzu kelpie just outside of jacksonville and it had run at their car and that was you so we are going to hear finally your account of this uh, kudzu creature kudzu kelpie and uh, i'm very excited to hear the the account because it was you know kind of mark's side of just this this email that you had sent but anyhow first though sally I want to know how you got into this. Was it personal experiences or were you just kind of always into the stranger subjects? Well, I was born into it, honestly. Um, my grandmother and my mother were prophetic dreamers and they would dream of things yet to come. And so I always grew up with stories of don't be afraid of if xyz would happen because i had a dream don't worry if you hear xyz because i had a dream this is what i grew up with so i was a timid child and so it it did bother me and i didn't i didn't really want it but it did happen and i saw my mother after she had passed i had experienced things in the woods that i couldn't explain it was a, a, a Bigfoot experience, really, that really kind of tipped it. But I didn't have the words to really express it. My mother and I were lost in the woods, and there was a kind of a, a haze, a shimmer. You know what you get for um, when you're dealing with a mirage. And these two creatures that were sitting kind of in a ravine stood up and walked into the shimmer and disappeared. 
Now, my mom immediately turned away and she says, I didn't see that, did you? You didn't see that either. And I remember this day saying, I see what? I don't know what I saw. And I didn't know what I saw. It didn't come to me until later that this wasn't a bear. This wasn't, you know, anything else other than I can explain as being a pair of Sasquatch that stood up and walked into a simmer, walked into this this weird barrier and disappeared. And then I started to read and I read voraciously. And then <laughs> April 1st, <laughs> 1987, changed my world. It rocked my world on that day because a little song came out in Northern Michigan on WTCM radio called The Legend. I don't know if you've heard of it. I recommend Googling it, but it was meant as a joke. But it opened the door to the dogman stories that are so prevalent now. And that's how it started. <laughs> but as for the kudzu creature, I was in the midst of doing a rescue for my father-in-law. Um, I was driving to New York to pick him up. And I was right on the heels of Hurricane Elsa. It had just literally rolled through. And so everything was wet and everything was in turmoil. And we got on the road very, very early in the morning because we just couldn't sleep. So we were too long and we had just passed Stark. So we were right between the area of Stark and Jackson. A lot of swampland and whatnot. And growing up on a farm and growing up a child of equine, uh, I raised and trained horses. I was on a Michigan State equestrian team, Michigan State horse judging team. I know what a horse looks like. I know the distinguishing characteristics of, of a horse. And I saw movement on the side of the road. And the back line was that of a horse. It was very much distinguishing. It was a horse coming up up out of the ditch. But when it came up out of the ditch, <laughs> it really wasn't a horse. And I knew this because the legs, the bottom where the, the hooves were, were transparent. And as soon as it came up right by the, the caution barrels of the road construction, the front hoof, what would have been the front hoof, touched the, the concrete just in front of my car and it disappeared. It just completely, all of it disappeared. And what it looked like was a horse shape that was covered, literally draped in, in kudzu and vine. You could see the shimmer of the water that would have been on this vegetation. Everything was there that would be a horse if it was visible. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't. And I asked my wife, who was riding with me, I go, did you just see that? And she was pale. She was just completely pale. I shook her out of it and was like, did you see that? And she's like, yes, I just saw that. So I'm like, okay, let's stay awake because obviously things are about and are creeping. Let's keep our eyes open. And I was not disappointed. We did see something else. You saw something right after that? Yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. I saw a pair of dogmen chasing deer. And the only reason I knew that they were dogmen is because the the height they were, they're about eight and a half to 10 feet high that were about three feet above the deer eyes. I saw eye shine and I saw the deer bounding because you can see the amber eyes of the deer bound and above it was these pair of red eyes that were not bounding. They were like a stationary run right behind them. I literally exclaimed, holy shit. <laughs> and Lisa did exactly the same thing on her side of the car. But she saw a completely different set of eye shine and the, the height of the dogman. And I saw one on the other side of the road. They're hunting in a V for me, driving the deer towards the, the road. And that shook me. That shook me a little bit. I don't like being between dogmen of like that of that nature. I don't like that. And uh, as soon as we got away from the area, I had to I had to call I had to write it down and 
I waited until I got to a hotel just to calm down. And then I, I contacted Mark because I'm like, Mark, have you heard of this horse thing? Because I, I didn't, I, I've heard of Kelpies, but I didn't put them into Florida because I'd never heard of them being here. And I didn't have the words. I was like, it, it just looked like a horse covered in vines. I was like, have you heard of this? And he's like, oh my God. Yes, I did. I had a trucker tell me this story and you're not going to believe this. So, and that's exactly how it happened. And I, I even forgot to talk about the dogmen with him at first because I was so focused on the horse. When I actually calmed down and started recalling and writing down what I've seen, I remember it's like, yeah, I had dogmen too. It was a supernaturally active night because of the storm going. How far down the road after you've seen this kudzu creature, did you see the dogmen a uh, hunting situation going down? To, it was not even 10 minutes, mm. not even 10 minutes. From what I understand from the researchers that do research on, on boots on the ground, there's a pack in northern Florida that roam the swamps. And so I, I know their general location would be in that area. Um, so I, I honestly was keeping my eyes open for deer, and that's exactly what I saw. But there was behind the deer, they were being driven by something taller with red the red eyes. Now, I didn't get a detailed look at them. I just saw eye shine and it was on eye shine on both sides of the car. They were literally a, a, te- a forming a, 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 a driving line for these deer in, in, in this pack scenario. So I was kind of sitting in the middle of that and I really wasn't worried about exact detail of it. I just was worrying about getting out of that driving formation. So I'm not, I wouldn't have them on either side of my car. I would be out of that range. And about what time of day was this? This was early in the morning. This was approximately about 3.45 to 4 o'clock in the morning. So there was not a lot of traffic. There was not a lot of anybody on the roads because it literally was right on the heels of the storm. It was a relatively calm drive. Just everything supernatural popped off. And and to you, that's an interesting point, is the fact that the hurricane came through, everything just got kind of stirred up. Yeah, um, I've noticed that, even Mark has noticed that in the past, that after a significant atmospheric disturbance, such as a hurricane or severe storms or atmospheric anomalies happen, energies get picked up. And when energies get picked up, Supernatural things tend to pop up that I've noticed uh, in, with talking with people and my own experiences. That's one of the things that we we um, agree on, um, that the energies pick these things up. And not to mention Florida is just covered in, in so much water. Uh, that probably adds to it as well. Yep, it's water in the way the limestone, the way that even the state is built going back centuries. There's never been a hurricane that actually hits like St. Pete itself directly, not since like 1921. So it's been over a hundred years and there's kind of like this weird perspective bubble over that the area, which is exactly if you look at the weather reports for Elsa, the hurricane that went through, it kind of dissipated over St. Pete and then came back in the panhandle and then shot right across to Jacksonville. It was this weird, because we were bracing for it. Um, we're on the west side, and that's a dangerous side of the state to be on when you're getting a good hurricane coming up your coast. And the flooding would be devastating, absolutely devastating. So we were watching it very, very closely. And then it just disappeared. And then it reappeared and ran over Jacksonville and right up the east coast. And we were right on its tail the entire way up. So. It was a strange night. <laughs> I would say so, and I don't blame you for hurrying to the hotel and being like, "Okay, like we're not going going back out for a little bit here." Uh, there, there were there was a little bit of shaking involved, and a, a a whole lot of I need to calm down. I need to calm down. <laughs> going on. I mean the the kudzu 
horse would have been enough. The, the Kelpie would have been enough. But then to see what you did 10 minutes later, you're going, okay, then let's just chill for a little bit. So before we cover Dogman more, which is a subject I am certainly fascinated by, zipping back to your Bigfoot experience when you were younger, if you hadn't have actually seen the creatures walk into that shimmering, would the shimmering, like once they walked into it, was the shimmering then totally gone as if it had never existed and they never existed? It was it, like it dissipated. Um, it was like really tall. And then it it kind of worked its way down to almost knee level to a very small plane and then just kind of like went away. Mm. It, it didn't, it was like, it was, a large event on the horizon and then after they walked through it just kind of it just kind of sunk and then went away it, that's the best way i could describe it and it was at a distance it wasn't it was i wasn't terribly close but i wasn't far enough away in my my heart to be safe from it right but i always remember and i never forget that whenever i see that that weird shimmer i'm just like i don't there's a part of me that doesn't want to look because i don't want to see anything come out so i always look away even even though i know it's a mirage on the beach i'll i'll look away just because i don't i don't i really don't need to see that i'll just i'll leave that to the professionals <laughs> have you been in the woods again and seen that shimmer uh, no, I've been in the woods, yes, many, many times. Um, but I have not seen that shimmer in the locale because this was in uh, northern Michigan. This was in an area around Petoskey. And so it was in the deep woods and there's, you know, bears and critters that, you know, you're not the top of the food chain there. And so when I saw that, I knew I definitely wasn't and I was a child. And so it was terrifying. And even though I've gone back into the woods, I have not seen knock on wood that shimmer in the woods again. And how about the the Sasquatch, Sally? Were they the quote unquote classic Sasquatch, mm -hmm. super tall, covered in hair? I mean, were they the same size? Did they look at you guys at all? They did not look at us. Um, there was a larger one and a smaller one. It was the standard, what you would consider a Sasquatch, um, a very primate looking um, pardon me and so they're very primate looking uh broad shoulders but the smaller one was a uh, felter it was not as muscular so i could only assume that it could have been a youngster but not a baby um just smaller and and, and build and it was like they were sitting in this little nook of an area and then they just stood up and then they walked in. They didn't look at us. They didn't make an indication that a scent was caught. They didn't do anything other than just stand up and walk in. It, the whole event took maybe 10 seconds at the most. It was very, very fluid and peaceful. There was no, there was no predatory feeling about it. They just walked away. And they, it's almost like they walked through a door and they just went away. My mind as a child, you know, I was terrified because that one single event was terrifying. But it was only a, just a, a click in my life of the supernatural. And it was just one of the most significant because it was a first. And it took some while to, some time to deal with what I actually did saw. And it took time to accept that what I did see was something that would be considered paranormal, that would be considered uh, supernatural, that would be considered not normal for, you know, people wandering in the woods collecting mushrooms. It was something that was extra. And so as I grew older, and I started studying uh, things that go bump in the night, I started to accept it more. Because even, even to this day, it's still in the core of me that it's, I'm still very scared. And even though now I, I look for them, it's something that still terrifies me. 
if and you, this is something I had to accept. So. If you hadn't have seen them but walk I'm, into that that shimmering portal or whatever we want to call that, and then you started into the research and you're going out in the woods, do you think that you would still be in the flesh and blood camp or maybe 50-50 if you hadn't have seen that? I honestly... Uh, this is where my Mulder Scully is at, at war here. Um, I want to believe, I want to believe, but I believe in flesh and blood and science. Um, extra dimension, yeah, it's completely possible. I can't scientifically prove it, but I believe that it could be. But I want to see more. I want to see, I want to see scat. I want to see fur. I want to see blood. I want to, I want the physicality of the science so I can see it and touch it and um, analyze it and, and and do that to anchor it to be no longer, you know, it's just wacky Sally doing her, her UFO research or whatever. It's, it's where there's science involved. And so I believe I'm 50-50 on it. I believe there could be extra dimensional. I've seen it. Um, I didn't make it up. I didn't dream it as a child because my mother was right there. And even though she has passed on, he believed me. Even even though he was scared, he he knew what he saw. I knew what I saw. It was there. I can't I can't explain it, but it was there. All I can do is, with the tools given now, is say, uh, yeah, they're probably extra dimensional. There's uh, there's something to this because Skinwalker Ranch again dealing with complete extra dimensional. Uh, beings and whatnot, it is completely possible that it could be more than just a spot in the United States, that this actually did happen. I wasn't dreaming. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't doing anything of that nature because smoking or drinking was not, you know, a thing in in the, with the age bracket that I was in. So why why couldn't it be? So besides the words extra dimensional, you also just said the word extra, which I like because, and I also like your explanation. So you're saying, you know, when they're here, they're flesh and blood and like you want, you want to see bone and, and blood and hair and all that stuff to, to get the evidence. But like you said, maybe they just have that extra, whatever that ability is to pop in and out and go into these little shimmery spaces. And of course we've heard of other things coming in and out of shimmery spaces that are really pretty darn terrifying. Yeah. And dangerous, dangerous because of maybe what they've encountered before on our side, because we're not the tamest creatures on the earth. It could be very much dangerous. And even it's world altering. You're dealing with something that you, you have a known worldview and you're dealing with shaking the very foundations of your known reality. It, it can be psychologically scarring, which I live through. And I know others who have experienced, whether it be a UFO or if it's a dogman or if it's a Sasquatch or if it's a ghost or a demon or an elemental, people have experienced something that altered their worldview. And it, has, it takes a while to adjust. I am open to it. I am open to them having something extra. Their ability to communicate telepathically is come under fire, but it's like, why couldn't they? They A por- portion of their brain could be activated to tap our consciousness to communicate non-verbally. Why not? So yep, Communicate chemically. So... so- <laughs> What about dogmen then, Sally? Do you feel they're exactly the same in that they're flesh and blood while they're here, but they have that extra thing, and then they can kind of paranormally speaking do other things that we consider very, very strange for a a straight flesh and blood animal? Yeah, only because, again, this was this is with experience. I have never physically seen, other than the eye shine. Oh, a dogman. I've never come across that. And the the people that have experienced these creatures, they're they're soul shaking. These are very large predatory creatures. And sometimes people have been said that they 
can hear them in their head or they they can't verbalize really but they can more mentally project words that they they this is what they say well it's heavy into my dog man research early 2000s i was living eating breathing find researching dog men up in Tampa, up near Luke, I knew what I feel is very close. I, I feel, and this is, I'm talking about the telepathy thing. When they say when you're looking for a dog man, they can sense it and they can either leave or they'll try to scare you away. They don't want to be found. And I was, I was looking, I was actively looking. I felt in my mind, I just felt like something was off. And so I came home and I put my gear away and take a shower and get into bed. And the dream uh, I had, I could see it coming. I could, I could feel it coming. I could feel the curiosity. I could feel why are you looking at me? I could feel, I could feel the words, if that makes sense. And this juvenile, which was red with a, a red coloring with a black stripe down its uh, face and back, appeared. I, I, I stopped in my dream, and then I, I can, I can lucid the dream. I can control my dreams where I can, if I, something is scaring me, I can leave. And so I did, and it followed to another dream. And then it did it again, and I finally turned and faced it, went at it. And I, I knew it was a juvenile, and I knew it was just curious, but I, I went at it to scare it, and it went away. And I told this to other researchers, and they said, that was kind of a, a warning. Don't, whatever you're doing or wherever you are, don't. Because if that's a juvenile, that means there is a path nearby, and that could be dangerous. And so I, I stopped research immediately. And I never had another dream like that. I never saw it again. But when I'm up in the loose area, I kind of feel what? If I'm up there in, in the wooded areas, I can I can feel it. And so I just don't go up there and now. We always hear reports of dog man. And I would say, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but 90 or more percent of it is they are just pissy as hell. Uh, I, I mean, who knows why, do you have any, any, you know, background on why they are just so very angry? A lot of times Bigfoot are more little creepers and they're just watching and yeah, they don't want to be seen, but they're not going to puff up their chest and, you know, essentially run you down where, and we've heard reports like that of dog man. Yeah. My theory, my, my background is just to make a quick side jump, just so we know. Um, I am an anthropologist. I have my degree in anthropology. I have studied uh, human culture, but I've also have a degree in animal science. So I've studied animal behavior as well. I'm not just stumbling into this. It's like, oh, I found this cool library book. Let's go this way. I have actual background in both animal science and anthropology. And these are anthropomorphous animals. Um, these are, they are still very animal brained. And our, Parasitic use of land has encroached their territories to the nth degree. They, if they are anything like wolves, they run a territory. They're territorial. They don't like other things in their territory, which is why you get a lot of the Sasquatch and the Dogmen um, combatants. They don't get along. But they don't. Dogmen don't get along really with a whole lot of anybody. Not to saying that they can't, they just don't. They're just territorial. Canines, what these are, by the very looks of them or what reported looks of them, they just don't like to be mucked with. They they want to live their life to be left alone. They don't want, need, or desire westernization popularity um they don't that's not 
their modus operandi. They want to live, eat, make little pups, and live their world unmolested. I can respect that. Um, but our world is shrinking smaller and smaller. We're losing natural habitats all over the world. Even things that we don't think as being really um, driven out are, uh, like the land between the lakes area. It's beautiful and expansive, but, you know, you've got people on all sides. And that's a notoriously aggressive passage there. And you get up in there and it's possibly your life. And they just, they can't, there's no escape routes. There's no, there's no easy way to remain undetected with video surveillance and people being 24 seven all over. It's so we're seeing them now more and more as we encroach on their territories. And yeah, they're grumpy because they just want to be left alone. My take anyway. And since you've heavily researched both, do you think there are just as many Bigfoot as there are Dogman in the U.S.? Yes. And I think they're almost quasi-speciated, kind of like Yeti and, and Skunk Ape and the the Barden Booger and things of that nature. I think they're different names for variants depending on where you get Dogmen the same. You're, you're reporting some that have tails and some that don't. Um, you've got oh, I don't know how many like twelve different variants now where they're 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 pug nosed or they're really tall ears or they've got the weird shaped legs. Some are more werewolf like. Some are more dog like. So there's variants and may not be completely speciated, but they're definitely like breed oriented. Like dogs, um, you can put a husky next to a pug and they're dogs, but they're completely different. And I think this is what's happened with these creatures as well. It's it's a theory, and again, can't scientifically prove it because I don't have blood, bone, and, and hair. But it would make the most sense based on uh, other people's research that I've gone through and going through reports. Almost every major landmass has some sort of dogman or sasquatch on it. Am I wrong? Um, the only place I haven't seen it is Hawaii, only because of island. And to get a creature that big on a, such a small series of islands would be near impossible. But every other place does, including England and Scotland and Ireland. They have the cynocephali in Italy and and the the wolves of Germany and things of that nature that are dogmen or wolf like that would explain the bipedal canid and werewolf. Um, this, this, if you take all of this information about bipedal canids and you put it together and, and say this would make sense why somebody saw a werewolf because it would look like a werewolf. It may not be, you know, Jim down the street, but it's still indicative of a werewolf. It would it would have human type features. It would have, if you look at the skull, it would not have a frame of magnum that would be in the back of the skull. It would be underneath, which would be indicative of bipedalism. Um, same way with a butterfly uh, pelvis. So you have those physical distinguishing characteristics that would say this is bipedal as opposed to this is just standing up like bears do. Yeah, I guess it's that whole thing where you're going, well, Jim's a real a-hole, but maybe not that big of an a-hole, you know, to be a dog. <laughs> he's not going to eat your cat. Yeah. Well, he might, but it's not going to be because it's a werewolf. Yeah, you don't have to <laughs> run in at the full moon, okay? Jim's going to stay Jim. Um, so Sally... Exactly. And he's like that 24-7. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And so is a dog man. He's just a big, pissy dog man. Uh, so as exactly. we know... No significant bones found for Bigfoot, and that is, of course, the same 
as a dog man. And of course, you're talking about, you know, just science based stuff, which I love, which it means that, you know, it looks like Bigfoot, they have clans and families, and uh, units that they'll move around with, for the most part, we've heard of rogues, of course, I'm sure that's a thing with a dog man as well, but pack animals, right? So they have these yeah. family units. So is the thought then with the bones, you know, you've heard of the theory that Bigfoot then buries their dead, and that's why it's even harder to find uh, bones in, in the wild, and we know that's hard anyway for even the species that we know of that are proven. Do you think then that the thought is the same for for Dogman? If, if one of them is felled, then a, a fellow Dogman comes and, and buries them because they know that people finding the truth would be a bad thing. One of the things, if you if you look at our nature as we know it, there are things that animals do that would run contrary to how humans would do things. One of them is um, animals generally, whether they're a prey animal or um, you know, or, or an animal that is um, hunted, um, they eat the placentas of their young, correct? Like you'll, you'll see a deer or even your rabbits, um, dogs that eat the placenta. My theory, and it, it is just a theory, it is not scientifically proven, that with a higher intelligence where they don't want to leave evidentiary support behind, you would eat your dead. Um, you would dispose of it the most cleanly way possible, where there wouldn't be scent behind to leave a chance of other predators, rival packs, humans, to find blood and bones behind. You would give them, it would be a burial practice but it would be done so there would be no further predation upon the primary path. There would be no scent trace left. There would be no no evidence to follow the family unit away. They would just be gone, which would lend support to why we couldn't find bone, why we couldn't find hair or flesh left after even a large battle of between tax or Sasquatch and Dogman or what have you, eating your dead or claiming your dead in that manner would alleviate that from the equation. They would no longer be there to be disturbed. They would be forever with the clan. I like that explanation. Yeah. Uh, Barry goes further and then even further is they, they eat them. That actually does make a whole lot of sense to me. Yes, it certainly does. Nope. This would be, I'm, I'm running on the science side of this where I'm looking at other species and, and their practices. And they, from birth, you eat from birth, you eat from death. It would be a cyclical that would make sense. Yeah, especially for something of a higher intelligence like that, right? Right. Now, what and about... I, as I said, people people generally don't eat other people. I mean, they have. But um, as a funerary practice, that's not something that's socially acceptable. But maybe in their society, it is and expected. Right. Right. Yeah, to us, that, that seems pretty dark and disgusting. But to them, it's just normal. So how about this pack in North Florida? What kind of reports have come in about this pack? What's the closest that anyone's gotten to one or any any physical interaction? We don't hear about that a whole lot with Dogman, but what kind of reports are you getting out of there? Well, there has been people, um, this is, you can visit other um, sites that have people reporting Dogman experiences, but from what I understand, um, there's two significant packs in northern Florida, one that's closer, more really Georgia than it is Florida, but they run the same ter territory down to a uh, dark area where the, the three prisons are. There's also a swamp preserve, which is a state-run uh, part. There's also those weird circle lakes that are there in that area. It's kind of a big triangle in the northern Florida that the, from what I understand, I, I don't, 
I don't know for sure because I don't have tagging mechanisms on 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 dogmen, and I'm not boots on the ground anymore. I have I have retired from boots on the ground. I can only take secondhand reports. But it seems that in that swampland, in that area between Stark and Jacksonville, Georgia, there seems to be two paths that range and wander. Um, all the way down, I've heard reports. Um, like I said, in, in northern Tampa, they're in Lutz area, and over towards Bradenton, there's a national park down there that they have gone that far south. They don't really go into, from what I understand, the big swamps of South Florida, because that's where the skunk apes really are prevalent. And so they kind of don't overlap those areas, but it seems to be two packs in the North Florida area. So uh, considering what I've learned about you and especially that Bigfoot sighting that you had of the two Sasquatch early on, I'm assuming that you probably would not want to actually see a dog man. Oh, see, I I am so split on that. It's like, yes, I desperately want to see with my own eyes to see, to see them move, to see the intelligence in their eyes, to see that. But in order to see the intelligence in their eyes, I'm entirely within striking distance. And I have an overdeveloped sense of staying alive. So I, yes, I do want to see one, but no, I don't want to see one. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, that that completely makes sense, especially when it comes to a dog man. Um, and I think that even just seeing a Bigfoot, and I've said it many, many times, I'm just dying to see one so bad. But it, sometimes in order, like you said, to confirm 100%, what you're looking at, you have to be pretty damn close, and that could change your whole life. Or end it, um, especially end it, with yeah. dogmen. They're they're not cuddly. They're 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 not your you know fluffy. They they'll they'll take a chunk if given a chance, especially if you read the reports, especially the the land between the lakes family decimation. That just that blows my mind. That is coming from several credible sources that they they just walked right into this family's camp and, and chewed them right up, all of them. And so that's kind of terrifying. And even hearing reports from people just doing normal things, just going for a walk where they'll walk with them and they'll just watch them. That's terrifying. That's, that's really, really terrifying for something that is so soundless in the woods until they want to be heard. And then you've got something that is eight to 10 feet that is astronomically huge. And by our own own admission, something that is unnatural, that is, that is like I said, that's foundation shaking. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't hesitate to pee. Um, I understand why people would. And I, I want to see it, but I don't want to see it. <laughs> I'll be happy to read about other people's encounters and say that you're not crazy, that this did happen to you. Now it's time to start thinking internally how we can cope with dealing with a new reality. Sally, I'd love for you when you have time to listen to, and I I don't remember what episode number it is, uh, but it's called Dog Man on Temple Road. And it is, he's now a judge and he had a horrifying dog man experience. And I just, one of these days, if you ever think about it, I'd love for you to, to listen to that one. Cause that's, that's on my no list. Um, and I bet it would be on yours too. <laughs> so anyway, probably, um, there's, yeah. there's some, the list is dog man stories out there that some of them, uh, there was one of an ambulance driver and his, um, his paramedic in his ambulance in Connecticut that, um, I was listening to it and everything, everything that he was describing was this is predatory behavior and this is what a coordinated attack would do. I don't envy their position and I, I don't remember what it is, but I'm sure you could Google it and you could find this story and it is just chilling to the bone. And it's just like, oh my God, I can't, I can't. I'm, I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to read, you know, Alice in Wonderland and be happy for a while. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just curl in a ball and eat some candy and, and read something nice. Darn it. 
Yeah. You, you know, Tootsie Roll is a medication. I'm just saying. <laughs> Heck yeah, it is. Um, yes, it should be prescribed. Uh, yeah, they're hunting. Indeed, indeed. Their hunting tactics are just flawless, you know, like a pack of wolves. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a big no. And that's one of the things, going, understanding wolf behavior, I raised a high percentage uh, wolf dog when I was in high school going into college uh, because I was studying wolf and wolf communication. So I had, his name was Suka, and uh, Suka was very much, very wolf-like, except for his coloring was very... Uh, Malamute looking, but his his percentage, his blood percentage was very high. He was um, 83%, I believe, uh, Alaskan timber wolf, and you know, 18% uh, uh, Malamute. And so this animal, his movement, um, his communication, his eyes, the way they don't, wolves don't bark. They they growl and grunt and and things of that nature. I learned so much working with that animal that I can identify tracks and I can identify wolf calls and coyote calls and things of that nature. That only gives me basis of what I'm not looking at. So if I'm looking at dogman tracks or what have you, it's like this is indicative of a, of, of a timber wolf, but it's not a timber wolf because of X, Y, Z. And so Suko was such an educational inspiration for me going into this weird field of cryptozoology. And um, I say this because it's not just Dogman, which I'm dearly in love with, um, and Sasquatch, which I've always loved. It's other wild creatures that we don't see. Like a giant panda was a cryptid until 1963. 1963. We take them a panda for granted now, but prior to that, it wasn't a scientifically designated species. Same way with the the thylacine. Uh, thylacines were real. You have pictures of them, but then they've gone away. But have they? Uh, out of Tasmania and out of Australia, there's still sightings of the thylacine. You know, we don't know how these things survive which means we don't know how all things. So Sally, moving off of dog, man, something that I wanted to zip back Mm -hmm. to when it comes to your, your Kelpie, the uh, kudzu creature, you said that once the, the hoof hit or was going to hit the pavement of the highway, it just simply disappeared. And I wanted your opinion on the fact that, I mean, that was kind of strange. They, could it not cross the road? Did it not want to cross the road? Or, you know, do you think because the road itself is man-made and it, was, it wouldn't be connecting anymore with the earth and the soil and the water, what's the thought there on, on why it disappeared? That's an excellent question. And um, that's one of them that I have thought about. I, I did some reading on Kelpies and what they do. They're not entirely nice creatures. They draw people to them who lure them to their death. Now, I was moving at a rate of about 45 to 50 miles an hour because I was in a construction zone. It was a, not a high rate of speed. I did see it come out of the ditch, and it was there on, on the top of the road. But it, again, it seems it hit that, that barrier. It, the barrier, I would say, that which is a good call as being man-made, it literally, it, it touched it and just disappeared. It didn't look like it was looking at. Me. The eyes were very not focused on me. They were looking forward. They're looking across the road from me. I don't know if I was an intended. I was just a happenstance encounter. Um, I don't feel that I was threatened. I, I didn't feel that it was coming for me or for my wife. I just felt that it was trying to get over. It just would have stepped in front of my car. When we were right even with where it would have been, there was nothing. There was no feeling. There was no aggression. There was no fear. There was, it it just, it was like, I don't think I was intended. 
uh, whatever it was doing, it, it had focused on other things, just like the dog men were 10 minutes later. They were focused on getting deer. Their, their Bambi breakfast was right there. They weren't interested in, interested in me. This is all happenstance. And so I feel I was very lucky that night. And I feel that the Kelpie was just trying to get from point A to point B, not as an intended victim. You know, it makes you wonder, you know, if these things could be infinite or however old maybe, you know, it was, how long it had been in the area, if that road was just laid right through its home, through its domain, you know, and now it's like stuck in this loop just trying to get over the damn road, but it can't. It's entirely possible. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't know in depth the full legends of the Kelpies. And I didn't even know that they were on this side of the pond. But it's entirely possible that it was brought over by uh, Native peoples, um, meaning the Irish or uh, Scotsmen or English, who had a firm belief and a firm fear of them, settled in the area and kind of willed them into into being, which is going back to my religious studies and things of that nature. If you believe it, you can manifest it. And if this is a belief system, this is a creature that was literally brought over from another country in a foreign land, dealing with foreign things and foreign people doing foreign things. And it doesn't have a regular route that it would have like it would in Ireland. You have the Moors in, in Scotland and things of that nature that are very predominant. The the lock system is very permanent. It's not really budged in hundreds and hundreds of years. But here in Florida, it ebbs and flows very rhythmically with the seasons and things of that nature. So it very well could be where it's like, well, I'm used to going this way. I can't go this way anymore. So it'll go another way. And it just, I just happened to cross paths with it. It was not, like I said, an evil intent. It was just it happens yet. And, and there's a million reasons why it could be. I can just speculate as to my experience of what it what it right. was and what had happened. And I remember Mark saying, and I just found this so incredible, not only the fact that he hadn't released any information yet and then you emailed him I mean, two weeks later, it's it was insane to me, and I know it, it shocked him, was the fact that you guys, you and the trucker, were essentially within, give or take, three miles of each other, this sighting. I think that's incredible. Yeah, it, it's, it's really very, very, very close, um, based on what Mark had said and my experience. And I, I, that's why I called him first. I'm like, have you, you collect information like this? Have you heard of this? And he's like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> yeah, this just happened, and and I really think a lot of maybe the reason that the kelpie was active was because we had an active storm season. We had, you know, they're digging up the land, or they're they're altering the pathway based on the road construction. Things were kicked up for this this creature that it was collecting energy and it could manifest itself, and and it just. It, it's moving while things are are in in flux, whether oh. it be the road or the weather or what have you. It's 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 given the energy to to be seen. Yeah, all I know is the next time a big storm rolls through there, I want to uh, get in the car, maybe get a posse of people, so more than just myself will see it, because that's always a bummer when it's just you, and then just drive up and down that section of road. I think that would be a pretty good idea. It would be it would be awesome, especially with a group of people. Like I said, I have verification. I have my wife. Uh, exactly. She saw it. I saw it, and um, we were wide awake because I had to keep my eyes open because one, it's so late in the in the evening and there's so many deer. I don't want to peel a deer, and so our eyes were on the road. We just had music playing and we we're talking and. Here we are. Here's this thing coming up out of the the, the ditch, plain as day, and it it's a weird feeling. It, you've experienced things where all of a sudden it's just you're you're cold, and then it, it's like electricity on your skin, 
And then you go, okay, I, I can't believe what I just saw. And we talked about it for that time. Oh, after the Kelpie. And then we come across the dog man coordinated a pat attack on the deer. And I'm just like, this is getting really too much. It's like, I need, I need, I need, I need coffee <laughs> just to settle my nerves. And we get to the hotel and it's just like, I got to call Mark. I just got to call Mark because I can't, I can't not call Mark on this one because this is what he does. This is what he is looking at. And this is the, the things that he needs. And if, like you said, if you had somebody looking for this thing uh, on a, a major storm time here, this is the area that I was in. Go, <laughs> please just be careful because there are dogmen up there in that same area. All I know is two more reasons to love Florida, Kelpies and dogmen. <laughs> That's all I know. Kelpies and dogmen. <laughs> well, Sally, did you want to switch gears again and talk about your UFO sighting? Oh, yeah, my UFO sighting. <laughs> this was right after 9-11. So this was literally two weeks after 9-11. We um, were going to New Orleans um, just to go to New Orleans and experience it. We'd never been there on an off season, and man, was it off. We were driving US-19 up for, in the Panhandle, which is infamous for UFO sightings. And we, you know, we saw the sign, you know, you know, 87 miles to Perry, which is 87 miles to Perry, no matter where you are, it's a geographical oddity. And we were joking about that and we were eating jelly babies and we had the God awful combination of lemon and coffee and <laughs> we were laughing so hard. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the road, there was like a rat or a, a mouse or some kind of rodentia running at us in the middle of the road. And so I kind of, I slow down and I, I swerve out of the way. And I'm like, oh my God, what was great? Why was it running down the middle of the road? And, and there's no idea. This this is so weird. And we continue joking about coffee and lemon jelly beans. And then uh, a raccoon come running down the middle of the road. I mean, the middle of the road, not, not to the side, not across from one side to the other, down the middle of the road. I'm like, so this one, this is the Zulu, what's going on? And then a deer, same thing, coming right down the middle of the road, right at us. And I almost feel that poor deer. It's like I jerked it and I kind of hit the road, the edge a little bit. I came in and it's like, there's something wrong. It's like animals don't run down the middle of the road. They just don't. They go across, go from side to side, not down the middle. Just then a Rick Springfield song came on the radio. And I went to change it because Lisa hates Jack and Diane. She hates that song. Oh, so I went to change it. And then all of a sudden, a spotlight hit us. It was this right from back going forward. And there was this light. And I'm like, what the hell? And I looked, and there's, there's no R. It's just a light in the sky. And it hit us. And I'm like, Lisa, look at this. And she looked around. And she's like, change the channel. And I'm like, so I went to change the channel, but it wasn't Jack and Diane. The clock read that there had been a 10-minute time shift, and it was a Prince song that came on. It, it was in that time frame, a 30-second for us, but it was 10 minutes based on the clock. Because I looked at it, it said, you know, 427, then it was 37 that quick we were no longer going 50 miles an hour we were at 15 miles an hour so time jump speed change song change time change so everything was great it happened that quick and i'm like holy shit it's a ufo i wheel around i could see it it was still kind of behind us but it was up over the trees and behind the trees a little bit and I'm like, there it is. And I, I went to hit the brakes. And that's when my wife started to yell at me and beat on my arms like, no, 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 drive, drive, drive. They're going to take us. And it's like, I think we've already done been took. I need the camera. I need my camera. And it's like, so I'm driving, but I'm trying to fumble for the camera. And she's beating on my arm. And then it came back up over behind us and was right there. And it's like, there was no sound. There was no lighting other than this spotlight 
and I could just make out silver, but I couldn't make out a shape. And I'm like, oh my God, this is totally Mulder and Scully. We're totally getting x file This is awesome. And she's screaming and crying. So I had to relinquish and I had to drive away, even though I wanted to stop. I, I I hit the gas to get out of there because she was really, really upset. And I, I started running it down in my head and I'm like, look at the time, look at the time, look at how how slow we were going. Look at the songs. It was Jack and Diane. Now it's not Jack and Diane anymore. It's a Prince song. It's like, oh, what just happened? What honestly in our mind, did we just go to sleep for 10 minutes? Did we both at the same time driving a car, dodging animals, go to sleep for 10 minutes? He was really upset. Well, needless to say, I was awake until we actually hit New Orleans and hit our hotel. But it was such, for me, um, it was exciting and scary. And for her, it was terrifying. Because we don't know what happened in that 10 minutes. We we have no memory. We have no recollection. We just know that there was a time jump. There was a song jump. There was a speed deceleration past normalcy and life and wild animals. That's what I know. Yeah, I don't know how I would respond to an experience like that. I don't know if I'd be more like you or more like Lisa, because when you realize that there's 10 minutes gone and somehow, like you said, you're still driving on the road, granted you've slowed down, but you haven't run off into the ditch. You know, you haven't gone into an accident. How does that happen? And what has happened to you guys in the 10 minutes? I mean, has there been any of the, you know, the other, I guess we have to call it a cliche, but the the other telltale signs of, you know, marks on your body or, you know, anything, anything else? Yeah, I wish I could say I didn't even think about checking for marks on a body. One, it's the middle of the night in the side swamps of Florida. And and two, when we got to New Orleans, we were so tired. Um, We didn't think about that. I wish I did, but alas, I didn't. So I can't verify the marks on our body, but um, I can just, I can, I know that the time chunk was there because I was reaching for the radio to switch the, the song and I looked at the clock. I, I had my eyes on the clock and then my eyes weren't on the clock and everything had changed. I have not seen Lisa so terrified and she was. She was in tears and he was begging me to go. And it's like, like I said, my, my inner core was like, I need my camera. And I, but unfortunately this was before camera phones really. And I had to, my camera was in the back, in the back seat. So I, I, it wasn't, wouldn't be as easy as it is today. If it happened today, I'd, my, my cell phone would be like, click it, click it, click it. It would be there. But um, it was, it was such an, exciting event for me uh because like i said i i grew up with this stuff that, that wasn't my first ufo that was just the closest ufo it was in the height of or a resurgence of x files and really it was to me it was it was it, it tickled me in all kinds of fun ways and i just wanted to see it but like i said lisa was absolutely terrified and um the thing I can't explain it. I can't explain what happened to that ten minutes. I can't explain what what had actually happened. Why did those animals run straight down the middle of the road? Why did they not cross from side to side? Why did something so close make no sound? None. What what could it have been? Could it have been? Um, military project because we were there in the Gulf in the Panhandle. There is activity there from uh, experimental aircraft from the military. Yes, it could be, but why? Why the why the missing ten minutes? Did we see something that we were not supposed to see? Did we did we stumble on something so late in the night that it was our own people that were doing it and we just had to retcon it? Just boom. I don't know. I, I don't know if it was terrestrial or extraterrestrial. I don't, all I know there was a UFO, an unidentified flying object. It was something that I did not know 
I could not identify. And we experienced this set of events. That's what I did. So exciting. (laughs) Again, very lucky that Lisa was there with you, right? Somebody to corroborate. That's always important. Uh, Does Lisa ever bring this up? He is a very logical person and he is an academic. He is a college professor. Her logic brain is in conflict with experiences that has happened to him. He does not really like to talk about things like that because, um, one, her professional credentials. If she was suddenly the college professor that, you know, sees the UFOs and, and ghosts and dead people, which she does, um, she's no longer, she views that it could no longer be her job, her career would be non credible. So she doesn't do a whole lot of talking around that. She does privately, and she does when we're in in group of people who are like minded, she will open up and talk. Because she, based on her heritage, she would be considered a natural witch. And she does see dead people and she can communicate when it freaks her out because she does have such a logical root on foundation. It messes with her, her life and her forms of reality. So when you're dealing with UFOs and dealing with the supernatural, yes, you can see them very well. Can she deal with them? Not really well. <laughs> so she kind of remains quiet. And when she's comfortable, she will talk about it. Yeah, I can't say I really blame her. I mean, once you're in that situation and you're realizing there's 10 minutes gone and somehow you're still driving down the road. Yeah, you're kind of going, oh, great. So what, we're up in the craft like Travis Walton? Like what the hell happened, you know? I don't don't think we went that far, but I do think it would be kind of like, well, let's do a scan. Let's see who these interlopers are it mm-hmm. would be kind of like a stop and scan okay there's no weapons there's no there's nothing but jelly babies and coffee and um you know it's it's not something that would be threatening and so we were just kind of I, I i believe that we were just kind of scanned and then it was kind of like a catch and release it was like oh look we got oh, okay you can go we weren't of interest because honestly at the time we weren't we, what you'd think of, like they talk about reproductive abductions and things of that nature. That's something that we would not fall into that category, just based on our physiology and, and things that are, are on our, our life. We would not fit into the, the the perfect human specimen to do that. So they would it would just be a catch and release. It's like oh, it's a trout with three eyes. Let it go. Mm. <laughs> well, that's an interesting that take. Us. Yeah. So, Again, like I said, with the UFOs, um, I've done some reading and, and third person spectating of other people's experiences. And people tend to have the really juicy, fun stories are the ones that are dealing with health and reproductive issues. Something is that if somebody outside was dealing with, you want a, a zoological specimen for a species, you want a good good portion of that. And not someone who wouldn't have three eyes or, you know, right. whatever. They, I would not be a prime candidate for a species pinpoint. I would be released back into the wild. And I feel that could be in it. Or it was just the U.S. military going, okay, they're, they're nobody. They're just going on vacation. Just move along. You know, you're not going to see him move along. Do the Jedi mind trick and off you go. It could go either way. It could swing either way. Or there could be another reason that I don't even know I haven't fathomed yet, but that's how I cope. That I was just not prime species for abduction material, so too soon. <laughs> Last question on this, and it may be hard to tell, especially since it was night, and if you weren't, uh, um, you know, maybe as familiar with the area as others, then you wouldn't really know this, but... I mean, and of course we have to go with the fact that you were going 15 and it's a whole math thing also, also, but would you be 10 minutes down the road from the last time where your memory was, or were you kind of sort of in the same spot? Do you know anything about that portion um, of it? Honestly, I, I couldn't do mathematically because I'm not familiar with the panhandle enough 
to say, yes, I could have feasibly been 10 miles down the road. And here I was, I, I, I can't do that because I do not know it. And oh, it was yeah. the middle of the night. It no wasn't problem. in a well-lit area. Yeah. So um, I wish I could provide that because, again, that is a scientific measurable uh, variant that I, that could be, this is what you did from here to here. This is what the deceleration would have to be. Unfortunately, I, um, all I can go is by the time and I can go by the the amount of miles per hour drop. So it would have to be just those two and not a triangulated um, right. mathematical variable. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. No, no problem. And besides that, you might have been going 50 for nine minutes and 15 only for the last one. We just don't know, right? So who knows what was actually exactly. going we down don't, there. We don't, exactly. The, we don't know the deceleration or the time frame per each uh, level of deceleration. We just don't know. I could have, could I have slammed on the brakes and then released? I don't know because class of mine wasn't there. Only physicality that I can't measure. So, <laughs> so last but not least, and this was at the behest of Mark Muncy, if you're okay to, to hang around long enough to tell this story, but he wanted you sure. to talk about Sarah the Squatter. And this has to do with Mark's house, I guess. Yeah. Um, there's Sarah and the Squatter. I completely forgot about the Squatter because he was outside where Sarah was inside. Sarah was a benevolent spirit who was very protective of the Muncie home. He was playful and she was always indicative of being around as being like a small blue light. And she would manifest in times of distress or in times of danger if something was happening, outside interference, like something that used to come through the Mark's backyard. Um, you could hear it in the leaf litter. It's something big and, and walking. Uh, it would come up to the house and walk around um, and you could hear it growl. And it was like, it was like a big dog or a big bear, but downtown St. Pete, you really don't get a lot of either in a fenced in yard. So there, um, I saw her once when I was sleeping over. I was in the guest bedroom and I saw the light come in under the door and I saw the light come up to the end of the bed and the bed just ever so slightly like someone had sat on it. And all I could do was like, hi, Sarah, and then go to sleep. And she got playful with the children when Beth and Callie were very young. And one time our friend Pat and I were in the Florida room and he was in the trash. It was like, it was a dog in the trash and picking up the trash bag and then putting it on the floor, picking up the trash bag on the floor. And I was grabbing all the time and like, Pat, Sarah's in the kitchen. And he's like, so what? <laughs> he rolls over and goes back to sleep. And I'm like, he's not really freaking me out because she's just picking up the trash bag and moving it, the trash bag and moving it. And nothing mean or nothing scary but one time what really freaked our friend ironically jimmy out was we were all sitting in the living room and we were all playing um dungeons and dragons and talking and you know ribbing on each other and all of a sudden right in front of jimmy or right above jimmy um there was a bright blue flash just like like somebody had flicked a, a lighter a pencil materialized out of the, the the light and dropped right in his lap and jimmy just sat there and he picked the pencil up and he set it aside, and he just continued on playing when he had just said that he was looking for a pencil. She literally gave mm. him a pencil, and we're like, oh, my God, this is awesome. And Jimmy's like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> he was not having it. <laughs> His little brain was not, he was not having it. But, um, yeah, that happened. Uh, and that was in the witness to at least six people that were there in the living room. It was just. And then the pencil dropped in his lap. That <laughs> is just, a cool story. Just, so Sarah was very cool. Now the squatter is, I don't know if you're familiar in the paranormal realm of, of what things are, but there's a creature. It's kind of like a fear monger. It eats the energy of people who are afraid. It's like, it's like candy or heroin for the spirits or something. 
And the fearmonger was very much attracted to uh, Hellview Cemetery because we put on literally a hell of a show and we were getting really good energies in there. And we were getting reports of one of our actors touching people. And we're like, Mm-mm, none of our actors are supposed to touch anyone. And so we went through and we made sure that nobody was touching people. And our our buddy Jimmy, again, um, he was coming up our, our easternmost hallway of the haunt. And he saw this guy who was in front of him, who was a guest. It looked like somebody had like shoved him and then flipped his hat off. And then he saw his wallet fall on the ground. And this guy ran. And so Jimmy went over and he picked up the guy's wallet and uh, went to the front of the house to give it to him. There was nobody there in the hallway with him other than Jimmy and this guest. It literally shoved him, knocked his hat off, and took his wallet. And I'm like, this thing is getting dangerous. And it would, it was touching people, and it was drawing from that fear. And it was just getting too physical. And um, Mark had to deal with that because it was staying too long and it was getting too aggressive. It was one of the strangest happenings that we had at Hellview. And it has been moved on, moved right along the ley line, so to speak, and just kind of moved it out. Because um, touching our guests was a bad thing. But that was that was the squatter. He stayed there for a while. And um, just liked eating fear. That's, it liked inducing fear and liked that. So it is since we've done and has found other digs elsewhere. <laughs> now, when did he first appear? Was it the very first year of Hellview Cemetery? No. Um, Hellview was a pro- work in progress from the very beginning. It was just started out as just a haunt, a, a front display. So it it was a few years into um, the full blown Hellview where we had the full blown walk through that it it took up residence and it was not active during the off season because it was a normal backyard. It and only when we get the walls up where you had we had to direct the pathways so it followed the pathways and so in the off season it, it, it really wasn't active just really during the haunt that it was really there and that last year where it was assaulting people it it, it had to had to go it had to go away because it was, it was even though we tried our best with the safety aspect of Hellview, there were still portions of it. It's still somebody could get hurt. Let's say that like what Jimmy described it, it looked like somebody had shoved him from the front, flipped his hat off, and his wallet fell out. That's that's three very strong events that could have the potential of hurting someone. Whether they ran into a wall or they tripped over a scene uh, a a scenic uh, item or what have you it had the potential. So um, once it was moved on, it energies kind of died that way down in, 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 in the, on the haunt when it was built. All I know is I hope that one day yeah, uh, Hellview is resurrected and I will absolutely be on a plane and hopefully helping out with that. If that ever happens. I would love it to happen. Unfortunately, like Mark and I and, and Jimmy and, and the, the senior crew who was a part of that, um, we're all old <laughs> and work and building a haunt in the Florida heat. It's, it's hot. It's, yeah. it's stifling. And the last couple of years we had wind problems where we had this beautiful facade on there and the wind was just taking it down. And then of course the ever fun neighbors that don't like having you know, a popular mm-hmm. attraction in the middle of a residential area. Well, see, and they, then the city gets involved in things. Yeah, that always gets fun. <laughs> see, the neighbors should have taken advantage of that and started to sell lemonade and, and popsicles or something. I mean, they could have capitalized on that. No, I know, right? That's what I was saying. Um, I, I, I totally, if I lived right next to Mark, that's what I would have done. I would, I would have totally been there. It's like. Here's your, I would have been selling water. Heck yeah. And, you know, candy. 
They would have cleaned and, up Tootsie Rolls, see? <laughs> it's not you, again, medicinal. It helps with the fear. <laughs> That's right. It's the fear monger. <laughs> you, you won't be able to smell you if you have the Tootsie Roll because you yeah. won't be scared. You have a Tootsie Roll. Exactly. Did it not work in Harry Potter? Awkward. Yeah, right. Dealing with the Dementor? <laughs> exactly. The same. Same, medicinal. same. <laughs> Well, Sally, it was really a treat to talk to you today. You have incredible stories and insight, and I really, really appreciate it. Do you have anything that, that you want or need to plug? Do you want to, you know, tell people where to find you? It's totally up to you. Well, if people want to find me, I'm not really that hard. I'm Lady S. Van Helsing on almost every platform, and that's Lady S, as in Sam or Sally, um, Van Helsing. And that's my my Twitter, my Insta uh all of that fun stuff. Uh, I'm I'm an author, and so you can Google me on Amazon. You can find me there. Which I had my first book was my um, all of my school papers that I had ever written about werewolves, witches, and ghosts. I took all. It was going to be my thesis, and I'm, I just put all of my papers into that. And I wrote a book called uh, Conventionally Speaking um, about people in their first experiences with conventions and fan conventions later. But for the most part, I am, I wander around the web like a rampant gypsy and I love it. And if anybody wants to talk to me, you can email me at lady helsing at gmail.com. And I'll, I'm happy to, to talk with you about any of the things that we talked about today or if you just want to say, you like D&D &D? and let's play D&D. &D. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's play D&D. &D. <laughs> Well, I will make sure to link your That's books me. and all your contact info in the show notes. Thank you so much, Sally. Absolutely. Thank you for contacting me. And I absolutely been a pleasure talking with you.